Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. So my name is Greg Penny. I'm the Director of Programs here at the Canadian Public Health Association, and I'll be moderating our the little bit of background about this webinar series. Uh, it's presented as part of CPHA's project, A Public Health Approach to Cannabis and Other Substances, Prevention, Health Promotion, Surveillance, and Capacity Building. The purpose of our project is to engage a range of individuals and organizations from health, public health, social services, uh, to enhance their knowledge of and capacity to address issues related to cannabis and other substances. This is the second in our webinar series uh, that we have been hosting and that focus on a range of issues related to cannabis consumption. One of the things I'd like to draw your attention to is the tagline at the bottom of the slide, normalizing conversation, not consumption. At CPHA, we want to focus on all of us discussing cannabis, its harms, its benefits, the impacts, safe use. This substance is going from illegal to legal status, and there's much to learn, and we need to focus on normalizing conversations about cannabis, not normalizing its consumption. And having said that, uh, we are partnering with uh, researchers and other individuals uh, who, to give them an opportunity to present their work in different perspectives. Our next planned uh, webinar is uh, with Dr. Matthew Hill. We haven't sent a registration up yet, but that'll be later in April, and we will email everyone. The next, get your, uh, your, Mouse is ready to. We have a we have a series of polls. Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Elaine Hishka. She's an assistant professor in of health policy and management at the University of Alberta School of Public Health. Dr. Hishka's program of applied health services and policy re research focuses on advancing a public health approach to substance use in Canada. Dr. Hishka is author of several peer-reviewed publications addressing regulatory, policy, and psychosocial strategies for reducing cannabis-related harm. As a former member of the Canadian Public Health Association's Expert Advisory Group on Psychoactive Substance Use, she contributed to the development of a 2014 position paper calling on cannabis legalization. More recently, Dr. Hishka was an expert participant of the Prairie Region Marijuana Legalization and Regulation Roundtable, organized by the Federal Task Force on Marijuana Legalization and Regulation. In June, she was appointed co-chair of Alberta's Provincial Minister of Health's Opioid Emergency Response Commission. With that, I will turn the webinar over to Dr. Hishka. Great. Um, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to present today. I think um, right now in Canada, with the uh, pending changes to cannabis law. It's an exciting and a really interesting time. And so um, I'm gonna get started here. All right, there we go. So um, today's the real objectives for today are um, just to kind of clarify some information about cannabis and what's happening in terms of legalization. I think right now it is an exciting time in that the law is changing and it has been decades since we've seen um, any kind of criminal justice reform. And as a result of this excitement, there has been a lot of um, different information and a lot of misinformation circulating related to cannabis. And so the focus of my presentation is going to be um, to clarify some of will be um, a brief overview of some of the risks and benefits of cannabis use. And uh, I'll go through some of the epidemiology um, quickly because I know that may have been covered in a previous webinar if some people on the phone have attended that before. Um, and then we'll just get into a little bit of the history of cannabis policy in Canada and go over some of the federal and provincial plans and outstanding policy issues. All right, so... What do we know about the risks and benefits of cannabis use? So um, I think this report is really helpful in clarifying um, what information exists. Uh, this is a, st a study from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that was published in January last year. And it reviewed over 10,000 different studies uh, assessing cannabis benefits and harms. 
Uh, and basically, the moral of the story after reviewing the 10,000 studies is that conclusive evidence regarding the short and long-term impacts of cannabis use remains elusive. And so, um, really, the prohibition on cannabis uh, has precluded high-quality research in a number of areas. Um, and so it's difficult to say with a lot of precision um, what the main sort of impacts are of short-term and long-term use. So that being said, um, they did grade and assess the evidence in a number of areas. And so I'm just going to review where they found substantial evidence. So not conclusive evidence, but substantial evidence um, in terms of risks. And so there is substantial evidence to indicate that cannabis use is associated with the onset of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Um, there is an increased risk of motor vehicle collisions, um, of having a low birth weight baby with prenatal exposure, of experiencing respiratory symptoms, particularly um, with longer term, more heavy use, and of a developing potentially problematic use in cannabis use disorder. I trust everyone has read the slide that shows the where there is some evidence related to benefit, and this is specific to therapeutic benefit. Um, but basically, the moral of the story when it comes to cannabis is that most people who use cannabis do so infrequently. They don't typically experience harm. And we know from the epi that use tends to taper off with age. And um, the main risks related to cannabis tend to um, manifest amongst people who start earlier in life and when they engage in cannabis use more frequently. So um, you may be familiar with EPI, um, so I'll just briefly touch on it. But essentially, we know from the latest data that just was published in March um, that 45% of Canadians have used cannabis in their lifetime. And 12% of Canadians uh, 15 and older report using cannabis in the past year. Um, Beyond that, 33% of those Canadians report daily or almost daily use, and that's uh, significant because we tend to see the majority of harms concentrated amongst people that are using um, free, frequently. Um, in terms of past year use rates, uh, it's, those rates are much higher amongst men than women and amongst youth aged 15 to 19 and young adults aged 20 to 24. So in terms of medical use, um, data from Stats Canada indicates that 235,000 or over 235,000 um, people are actively registered with licensed producers to receive cannabis products. And amongst um, 3.6 million Canadians who report using cannabis in the past year, almost or almost a quarter report that they're using it for medical purposes. So I, I like to go through some of the history of Canadian cannabis law because I think um, there's a perception out there that uh, this is a really novel and kind of wild idea that's never been discussed in Canada before. Um, but the data indicates that, uh, or sorry, that our experience indicates that um, this is actually not very new. So cannabis was first made illegal in 1923 and um, the rationale for that decision is not known. Uh, there is a theory that um, the uh, Cannabis Act was passed in 1923 because of public conversation around um, concern related to cannabis. And um, that conversation was largely being led by uh, Emily Murphy, who at the time was writing for McLean's and had written a number of pieces um, outlining sort of the menace that cannabis posed to society. Um, but the act was passed without debate in Parliament, and so it's not really known why or what the kind of rationale was for. And um, they haven't been able to establish sort of evidence to support this theory that Emily Murphy is the main moral entrepreneur that produces policy. But um, it's interesting to know that um, there wasn't even a seizure of cannabis in Canada until um, 10 years past the initial enactment of the prohibition. So cannabis law remained largely stagnant until um, around 1969 when uh, the government at the time struck a commission of inquiry into the non-medical use of drugs. And this commission really came about because of concerns that a number of um, primarily white and middle class young people were being criminalized for minor drug possession, particularly for cannabis use. And so the Ladane Commission reviewed the status of Canada's laws and they traveled across the country and they interviewed many witnesses 
and they came up with a report and their report um, recommended, the majority report recommended that um, Canada consider decriminalizing cannabis possession, so minor cannabis possession. But there were two dissenting reports and um, one was written by Professor Marie-Andre Bertrand and she actually recommended that cannabis or that Canada should go farther and that Canada should actually legalize cannabis and regulate it rather than just decriminalizing it. And so this was really the first time that we had a federal policy discussion related to legalization. And I think a lot of um, people would agree that this, at the time, that idea was ahead of its time. And so nothing really happened. And um, the report caused some controversy, but it was not adopted or the recommendations were not adopted. So um, fast forward to 2001, this is the R.V. Parker case. Uh, this is really the case that led to the establishment of um, Canada's Medical Cannabis Access Program. And so essentially um, Parker had been arrested for cannabis possession and he challenged the constitutionality of that, of that arrest and that law um, because he said that he required cannabis for medical purposes. And the Ontario Supreme Court ruled in his favor and found that it was an unjust prohibition, which violated his charter uh, charter rights, Section 7. And so this, um, the court basically struck down the provisions governing possession or prohibiting possession and gave the government a year to respond. And that's where we really saw the development of the first sort of large formal program for establishing medical access to cannabis. And um, since then, we have seen a number of policy changes related to medical cannabis and different iterations of the regime. But um, that's really the first, uh, since before 1923, that's really the first time we saw cannabis access or some access become legal. Now, around the same time, the Senate and the House of Commons were both conducting studies on Canada's drug laws. So this was coming out of um, some dissatisfaction with the Controlled Drug and Substances Act, which had been passed um, in, the, or in the late 90s. And so um, both the Senate and the House of Commons uh, committed to studying the issues related to drugs. And so the House of Commons uh, tabled a report, or well, in 2001, actually, the Senate tabled their report, and they recommended that Canada should look to legalize and regulate cannabis. Uh, and they found that um, the evidence supported a regulatory approach as opposed to a criminal or criminalization approach. Um, and then shortly after that, in 2002, the House of Commons came forward with a report as well, and they were a bit more conservative, but they did recommend that cannabis possession should be decriminalized. And so those reports really kicked off a policy window where we saw multiple attempts to decriminalize cannabis possession, so minor cannabis possession, um, between uh, between 2003 and 2006, and um, it's interesting because we, or my team, or research, the research team I was working with at the time, uh, did a lot of qualitative research with can people who are using cannabis, um, sort of in 2007, 2008, 2009, and uh, many of them believed that cannabis had been decriminalized, but um, all of the attempts actually ended up being unsuccessful, and the law was never changed. So that takes us forward to today, and the present law is that non-medical use is illegal, it continues to be illegal, and there's currently a maximum penalty for first conviction of, for possession of under 30 grams is a $1,000 fine or six months in jail, uh, and medical use is legal and it's currently governed by the access to cannabis for medical purposes regulations. And so there's three ways that you can obtain medical cannabis in Canada right now. Uh, the first is to purchase directly from a licensed producer. The second is to produce your own, and the third is to designate someone else to grow uh, medical cannabis for you. And so in 2015, the federal liberal, liberal government was elected, and part of their election platform did include a promise to legalize. And, um, and so that brings us to today, where Bill C-45 is currently working its way through uh, the parliament, um, and it's currently at the Senate. So why is Canada legalizing cannabis now? The official rationale is that um, despite ongoing criminalization and prohibition, uh, Canada has some of the highest rates of cannabis use in the world, and that's particu in particular amongst young people. And so this um, chart is just showing that the two uh, largest groups in terms of prevalence uh, for cannabis use are 15 to 17 year olds and 18 to 24 year olds in Canada. 
And this trend has remained constant um, for over uh, 15 years, or sorry, for ten, over 10 years. Additionally, um, despite what sometimes is the information that sometimes circulates, particularly if you live in Vancouver, or if you live in uh, certain areas of the country where the police have not prioritized cannabis convictions or cannabis charges, um, we do know from Statistics Canada data that 60% of all police reported Controlled Drug and Substances Act offenses are related to cannabis. So the, so the majority of law enforcement activity related to drugs is for cannabis. And 51% of um, those offenses are for possession. And 9% are for trafficking, production, or distribution. Um, and despite what you might have heard, uh, sometimes the police will say, that, well, we only arrest people or charge people with cannabis possession when we're charging them with other serious crimes, and this charge is often just tacked on. 55% of all cannabis-related possession cases actually only involve a single charge. So we are definitely still criminalizing people solely for the fact that they are in possession of cannabis. And so what are some of the negative impacts of criminalization? Well, first and foremost, we have differential enforcement across the country, which is an equity issue. Certain Canadians are more uh, likely to be charged and convicted of cannabis possession just based solely on where they live. Uh, if you are convicted, there's lifelong impacts on your employment and travel, which can seriously undermine your uh, social determinants of health. It discourages help seeking because it's criminalized and criminal law is the codification of stigma. Uh, it leads to profit sources for organized crime and potentially stimulates drug market violence. Um, clandestine production is unsafe and can lead to contaminated supply. And uh, criminalization also hinders effective population surveillance and screening, which makes it uh, difficult for those of us working in public health to understand who is using cannabis, um, their patterns of use, the doses they're taking, and really makes it challenging um, to put in place interventions to limit harms related to cannabis. And then the last piece of the rationale that the federal government has advanced for um, legalization uh, is in part, they argue that the majority of Canadians uh, support legalization for recreational use. And that is true, and that's been a consistent trend now for over a decade. So um, we know what the federal government's rationale is for cannabis legalization, but from a public health perspective, does this policy change make sense? I would say yes, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the first is that we know from the experience of other jurisdictions that criminal penalties alone are not particularly effective for deterring substance use. And so this graph is a little complicated, but essentially what it's showing is a number of European jurisdictions that have changed their cannabis laws recently. And so the orange lines are where penalties increased and the blue lines are where penalties decreased. And the um, division in the graph uh, is basically showing prior to the change and after the change what the use rate was for um, uh, people aged 15 to 34. And so really the take home message here is that irrespective of whether you increase the penalties or decrease them, um, they don't tend to map on well to patterns of use. And so there are other determinants of use uh, that are uh, more significant than whether or not the activity is uh, more severely or less severely punished. And so um, this provides some rationale for removing criminal penalties because once we take cannabis out of the sort of the criminalized realm, it gives us a lot more policy options to try and influence use and impact some of those other factors that are contributing to use patterns. Uh, a focus on criminalization too leads to an overinvestment in enforcement. Um, we know that in Canada, at least according to the most recent data, which is unfortunately a bit dated, um, the majority of federal resources dedicated to drugs go to enforcement. And so that really undermines our ability as public health uh, folks to, um, to secure resources to implement prevention uh, and harm reduction programs. And it also um, undermines the resources that are available for the treatment sector. So rather than taking a criminal justice approach, um, it really makes a lot more sense to focus um, on a public health approach. And so 
I know that this was reviewed in a previous webinar, so I won't spend too much time on it, but essentially a public health approach um, recognizes that there is a spectrum of use and that many people will actually engage in substance use and not experience um, significant harm and they may actually um, derive some benefit from that use. And so from a public health perspective, it's more important to focus on um, those members of the population who are starting to develop problematic patterns of use or are developing um, substance use disorders. So under a public health approach, um, enforcement and regulation still play a role, but the emphasis is really on prevention, harm reduction, and treatment. And so um, the effort, the idea is really to um, make substances legally available, but to strictly regulate them in a way that reduces demand and harm. And so um, essentially, it is not intended that uh, legalization would lead to widespread commercialization uh, and promotion and marketing, similar to how we see with alcohol, which I would argue is largely, especially in my province, Alberta, in the context of an unregulated legal market or a lightly regulated legal market, um, but rather to implement strict policies and regulations that um, make the substance available, but are um, designed to not induce additional demand. And so how can we do that? Well, there are a number of policy levers associated with legalization that help to contribute to better health outcomes at the population level and reduce some of the risk and harm. And so um, some examples are regulating production in terms of decisions related to what types of products are available and the number of producers that are allowed into the marketplace. Profit motive, and this is unfortunately something that hasn't been well discussed in the Canadian context, but um, because we kind of started from a point where we assumed that there would be a prop for profit industry, but other countries have looked at um, implementing nonprofit models for providing access to cannabis. Um, and so rather than having commercial interests produce and market and retail cannabis, um, having nonprofit collectives and other entities, including government owned entities, um, be the main uh, producers and distributors for cannabis. Uh, someone's asking about whether the slides will be available, and yes, I, they will be. Um, so additionally, restrictions on promotion can go a long way in preventing additional people from initiating cannabis use and investing money in prevention. Um, policing and enforcement still plays a role, and from a public health perspective, we can set priorities in terms of uh, what, what the police should be focused on, whether that's uh, securing the supply chain, or um, working to counter trafficking to young people. Uh, additionally, penalties. So what are those penalties? And I'll have a bone to pick here with Canada's current approach. Um, we saw in the Cannabis Act uh, that's still in Parliament that um, people who traffic drugs to young people are going to face a strict mandatory minimum sentence. And um, they could be as much as, I think it's 12 or 14 years, which is um, ex extremely excessive. And so the bone I would pick there is just that we know that the majority of people that are trafficking to young people are also young people themselves. So people selling to 17 year olds and 16 year olds are likely 18 and 19 year olds. And whether a mandatory minimum sentence um, is, a, is a good strategy from a public health perspective and from a social determinants of health perspective, I think uh, is questionable and certainly this does open the door for continued inequities uh, in who gets criminal justice charges related to cannabis. And I would suspect that we would see, similar to what we see now, where um, racialized youth are more likely to face such uh, penalties and, and charges in comparison to um, uh, white Canadians and white young people. So uh, another few policy levers we have is controls on potency. So that includes um, potentially setting thresholds for THC concentrations or setting minimum thresholds for CBD concentrations, as well as um, uh, re restricting high potency products or taxing them at higher rates. Um, and then purity relates to production standards and testing. Uh, price is really important. And I actually think in Canada, we aren't having enough of a conversation about price. There seems to be a lot of emphasis on completely undercutting the legal market. And so it's keeping the price as low as possible. And while it is um, 
a good objective to try and undercut as much of the legal market as possible. We have to recognize too that price is a big determinant of demand and um, of how often people will use cannabis. And young people in particular tend to be quite price uh, or demand or they, their demand t tends to be quite elastic. And so if prices increase, their demand typically goes down because they're more price sensitive than others because they have mm. less economic resources. And so I believe that every province should be setting a minimum price that um, is still competitive, but that uh, is not encouraging like a race to the bottom and uh, and inducing people that um, young people in particular that may have less economic resources to use more and higher volumes of cannabis. And then permanency is the last thing, and that's essentially we need to put in place uh, policies and regulations that are flexible and understand that this is a new new terrain and um, absolutely we will make mistakes and we need to be able to learn from them and change change policies um, in short order to adapt. All right, so what are the current plans related to ca legalizing cannabis um, at the federal and provincial levels? So I'll just spend a brief um, some brief time on the Cannabis Act because I suspect that many of you will be familiar with this legislation because it has been now in the public domain for a while. Um, it sets a minimum age of 18, although provinces can change that, and most provinces have opted to um, align with their alcohol age. It allows sales in, on an online forum or in retail outlets. It also allows Canadians to grow up to four plants for personal use and possess at any one time up to 30 grams of cannabis. Um, there are restrictions on advertising and marketing, uh, and currently it regulates the availability of fresh and dried cannabis, cannabis oils, and seeds and plants. However, edibles, um, the government has committed to regulating edibles as part of cannabis legalization, and they've said that they will do that within a year following legalization. Um, in terms of criminal prohibitions, they still exist. So any activity outside of the legal framework will still be um, criminalized. Um, so if you sell, distribute, possess, produce, or import or export cannabis, and you're not um, falling under a licensed producer or under the government regulations, you still are at risk for criminal penalty. And the medical cannabis program is currently planned to continue as is. Um, and this bill has passed through the um, House of Commons and it's currently at first reading in the Senate. And it's anticipated that it'll be, um, no one really knows when the Senate is going to pass it. And as a result, there's ex it's expected that there will be a delay in um, legalizing cannabis and that we may not see um, cannabis actually available for purchase in Canada until the fall. So under the Cannabis uh, Act, the federal government has a lot of leeway to enact um, regulations. And really the regulations are kind of the bread and butter of what the cannabis legalization framework will look like. And so the, uh, they're not waiting to pass the Cannabis Act given the short timeline. They've already enacted or they've already um, released proposed regulations. And they had a consultation period on these regulations that ended earlier this year. And they're currently in the process of finalizing the regulations. But what we know from the proposed approach, so these aren't um, enacted yet, um, but I suspect they won't change too much. Um, what has been proposed is that uh, for in terms of licensing permits and authorizations, uh, there will be space in the market for both large and small scale cultivators and processors and indoor and outdoor cultivation will be allowed. And they have proposed some pretty strict record keeping requirements um, for those that are producing and processing and distributing cannabis. Uh, there's a number of restrictions related to security clearances and who can work in the legal cannabis industry. And I think from a public health perspective, it's interesting because um, they, are, um, they are attempting to exclude people with associations to organized crime, but they are attempting to make space for people that have small scale criminal records for uh, cannabis possession or related charges, um, but no association with organized crime to potentially participate in the legal industry, which I think is the right decision from an equity perspective. Uh, cannabis tracking. So they're gonna have a single platform in Canada that will track the legal cannabis supply chain that um, people participating in the legal market will have to, will have to um, upload data into. Uh, 
Um, in terms of cannabis products, they're proposing a number of things be available, but of interest to us is that um, they will permit single use products. Um, although there are certain limits in terms of dose and quantity associated with pre-rolled joints and other single use type um, products. And then they are gonna require plain packaging uh, and there will be strict requirements for standardized information and mandatory health warnings. So this is more similar to what we see with tobacco than what we would see with alcohol, which I think is the right uh, proposal. And then the regulations also enact some additional um, rules around cannabis for medical purposes, health products and cosmetics. So if you have an interest in those areas in particular, I encourage you to take a look at this document. And so I just wanted to give a brief overview of what the provinces and territories are planning, um, just so everyone can kind of see how we're really going to have 13 different regulatory systems in Canada for um, legalized cannabis. So um, as I said before, pretty much everyone that's announced their legal age has aligned the legal age with, uh, with their alcohol or legal drinking age. Um, the retail models are quite varied across the provinces. So in BC and Alberta, they're proposing a mix of government and private uh, entities that will be are retailing cannabis. Uh, in Manitoba, they're focusing solely on private, uh, same as Saskatchewan. And in Ontario, Quebec, it'll be government owned and operated uh, retail. Um, in terms of retail locations, we're seeing most provinces proposing uh, retail locations that are bricks and mortar as well as online sales. And the range of the, and number of outlets that will be available varies quite significantly. For example, the Alberta government has indicated that they expect to license 250 retail outlets this year, which is far and above any other province, despite us being a relatively small province. And um, there's a lot of variation in whether public consumption will be permitted. Um, in Alberta, it will be permitted, but there are restrictions in terms of um, consuming cannabis related to or around healthcare facilities or where children will be uh, or children are present. Uh, in Quebec, as well, they're permitting can uh, public consumption. Ontario is discussing a ban on public consumption, although they have considered um, the possibility of licensing lounges or designated outdoor spaces. Uh, most provinces are opting against co-sale, so that's the sale of cannabis alongside alcohol or tobacco products, which is very um, sound from a public health perspective. We don't want to allow cannabis uh, to piggyback off the success of alcohol retail. And um, most provinces are allowing for home cultivation with the exception of Manitoba and Quebec. Uh, out east and in the territories, um, we see similar mix of options. So uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, and Northwest Territories have committed so far to government retail. Um, others are adopting hybrid models. Uh, none of it has not released a plan yet. Uh, one thing I'd highlight here that's interesting is um, that the Northwest Territories is proposing to sell cannabis out of existing liquor stores, as is Nova Scotia. And so that's um, very interesting. Uh, because essentially we know that most Canadians consume alcohol and uh, to sell cannabis out of alcohol stores implies a real opportunity to grow uh, the demand for cannabis and the consumption rates of cannabis because people will be exposed to it. Um, and so I'm not sure that's the best approach in those provinces. Again, we see some more variation around public consumption uh, with the uh, Northwest Territory saying that they will allow it, but the Eastern provinces and Yukon saying they Sorry, I think I just lost the connection there, but I hopefully it's back. Um, and then uh, again, we see a little more very, or well, we see most provinces allowing for home cultivation. And I think most provinces are allowing for home cultivation because the medical cannabis program does provide opportunities for people to cultivate at home. And I think there's an attempt to um, reconcile the home cultivation provisions in the recreational and non-recreational uh, parts of the regulatory framework so that there is an uh, incentive for people to seek a medical authorization just so they can grow at home.
All right, so I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple policy issues, and I might skip one of them just to save time for questions but just uh, and catch up from some of the delay. So it's important to know there are many, 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 many outstanding policy issues related to cannabis, um, how edibles will be regulated, as I mentioned before, the price, how consumers will be educated about cannabis, uh, what will be the enforcement and criminalization practices, and will they continue to exacerbate racial inequalities? These are all questions that we don't have answers to. Um, so, but I just wanted to touch on a couple that are kind of really top of mind in Canada. And the first is impaired driving. Um, and then I'm going to just conclude by talking a bit about funding for pre prevention, treatment, and harm reduction. So cannabis does impair psychomotor skills and judgment, and um, it is associated with an increased risk for uh, vehicle collisions if you use while impaired. Um, the challenge with impaired driving, though, is that it is difficult to test for cannabis impairment, and there's currently no um, known threshold similar to a blood alcohol level that uh, would allow us to objectively determine whether someone is uh, cannabis impaired. So we don't have a biological test for that yet. Um, uh, some addition, and some challenges are why we don't have that test is because THC has a long half-life and it can stay in your system for seven days. Uh, levels of THC in bodily fluids can't be used reliably um, to indicate impairment because people are different and because THC is fat soluble, depending on your size and how frequently you use, you may have higher levels of THC but not necessarily be impaired. And um, impairment also varies by how you consume it, so whether you eat it or smoke it, the time elapsed between or after use, and some of that inter individual variability I mentioned. So Canada is addressing impaired driving. They have tabled Bill C-46. This sets new per se THC level limits um, that people uh, should not be able, or these limits are restrictions that um, can't be present within two hours of driving. So essentially what they're saying is that if you have more than two nanograms per milliliter of THC in your blood um, to under five nanograms per milliliter, you're liable to a summary conviction and fine for impaired driving. If you have more than five nanograms per milliliter of blood or a combination of over 2.5 nanograms per milliliter and a 0.05 blood alcohol concentration, you're li liable to a hybrid offense, which it could be either a summary conviction or a, a full criminal uh, prosecution. And so um, this bill is interesting too, because in addition to these per se limits, which are somewhat arbitrary in that they don't correspond to specific science on um, on the range of uh, individuals and variability in terms of impairment. Uh, but the bill also opens the door for mandatory testing for alcohol impairment. And so whereas before police required reasonable suspicion to command a uh, breath sample at the roadside, this bill will enable police to um, randomly sample without need for reasonable suspicion. And so there, because of that provision, there have been questions raised about the constitutionality of this legislation, and everyone is expecting that it will likely, um, the, both the per se limits and possibly this alcohol piece will be challenged in court. So what's the prevalence of cannabis impaired driving in Canada? So the federal government just released results of the Canadian Cannabis Survey. And what it showed is that 39% of those that report pasture use report that they have ever driven within two hours of consuming cannabis. And amongst those reporting driving within two hours of use, 40% said that they did so in the past month. Um, if we look to jurisdictions like Colorado, Washington, and Oregon, we have seen some data to suggest that there is an increase in motor vehicle collisions, um, specifically claims, uh, relative to control street or control states. Uh, following legalization. So that graph there on the right is showing um, the variation across those jurisdictions. Um, but the combined column shows you the, imp the effect of increase of collisions um, after legalization. So that's bad news, um, but maybe somewhat more, slightly more positive news on that front is that although there has been a slight uptick in collisions in jurisdictions post legalization, um, this study here, which was just published uh, last year in the American Journal of Public Health, looked at whether that led to an increase in fatality rates related to those collisions. And they found that in adjusted difference and difference analysis, post-legalization changes in motor vehicle crash fatalities 
uh, were not significantly different from those observed in the control states that they use. And they, I think they had six or seven different control states that didn't have access to legal cannabis. So I'm just going to not cover this topic only because I'm running out of time, but it's on, the slides will be available so you can review it. And obviously, I'm happy to answer questions by email or after. But I just wanted to end with a note that there are a number of strategies for prevention, treatment, and harm reduction. And um, some of them were covered in earlier webinars, and I'm sure they'll be covered later. Uh, but that includes things like universal and targeted prevention campaigns, public education and awareness. Uh, screening brief, brief intervention and referral to treatment interventions for identifying people with problematic use patterns and uh, treatment, as well as uh, sharing information and putting in place interventions to encourage moderate use and lower risk use. But how will we fund these prevention, treatment, and harm reduction efforts? So in Alberta, the plan is that um, revenue will be generated from taxes and whatever's left over after all the administrative costs of running the cannabis system will go into general provincial revenue and then we'll set priorities and then at some point hopefully those priorities will be funded and we'll see initiatives emerging in washington state oregon and colorado uh, it's quite different so they actually have legislated priorities and the money that comes and is generated by cannabis taxes first goes to serve those priorities which then lead to initiatives, and then any money that's left over goes into general state revenue. Uh, so obviously that's a much more robust way of ensuring that there will be resources for public health to address the risk, potential risk and harm related to cannabis at the population level. And Quebec and New Brunswick, I'm happy to say, are doing much better than Alberta, at least, in terms of they both are proposing um, to take the revenues generated by cannabis legalization and fund um, either prevention and research, as in the case of Quebec, or education and awareness. And so Quebec's proposing to take all revenue that they generate and put it into a fund that will then be governed by an advisory board that will set priorities for prevention and research and fund initiatives with all of that funding. The New Brunswick model is to take 2% of, actually take a levy off licensed producer sales of 2% of their revenue uh, and that will go into an education awareness fund. And so I think those are two really good policy decisions made by those provinces. And I would really like to see other jurisdictions in Canada um, ensuring that they protect funding um, and earmark funds specifically for prevention, treatment, and harm reduction, um, rather than just sort of having that revenue flow into uh, provincial coffers and hoping to lobby successfully for these types of programs. And so I'm just going to end there. So we have 10 minutes for questions. Um, but basically, relative to criminalization, legalization provides more policy options for promoting public health. Um, it is true that understanding full impacts of legalization will take many years. And so we need research and ongoing monitoring and evaluation. And public health advocacy around some of those P's, the 10 P's of, uh, of legalization, and as well as um, securing access to resources and funding to prevent treat and reduce harm from cannabis uh, is critical and um, we really need to be quite active in trying to influence our provincial and territorial governments and the federal government to take appropriate policy responses that um, as much as possible reduce the risks related to cannabis legalization while maximizing the benefits and for the kind uh, remarks on the comments um, so Richard's asking, is there any information about when prevention and harm reduction resources will be provided by the federal and provincial governments? Public Health in Ontario would like to get rolling on this, but no information on when resources will be available. That's a really good question. Uh, the federal government has been making resources available. Um, they've, I know they've been working in partnership with the CCSA, Canadian Centre on Substance uh, Use and Addiction, to develop resources like materials that guide you on how to talk um, to your kids about cannabis and um, more resources are definitely in the works but they have a website I think it's canada.gc.ca slash cannabis and that would be a good starting point but um, I know there are a number of jurisdictions that are currently working uh, quite quickly to try and develop those resources so I would start there and um, and keep checking back because I think like I said this is uh, everyone's moving as urgently as possible uh, to get stuff out in the public domain. Uh, another question from Mohammed is, are you aware of proposed plans for 
of the approximately 500,000 Canadians with criminal records who are charged due to cannabis possession? That is an excellent question. I strongly believe that we should be pardoning those Canadians. I don't think a criminal record is um, for cannabis possession is um, warranted, frankly. I'm glad that we're legalizing. And I think that we know from the research data that having a criminal record absolutely undermines your ability to protect and promote your own health and the health of your family. Um, the federal government has not been clear on what they plan to do with those um, Canadians, many of whom are racialized and um, have had inequitable uh, or disproportionate, have been disproportionately criminalized but, uh, compared to uh, non-racialized Canadians. Um, they have said that they're committed to looking to see what they can do, but they have not committed to pardoning. And so currently, the only option for those Canadians would be a record suspension under the current um, provisions for any criminal criminal record offense. Uh, Sarah is asking, do you have thoughts from a public health perspective on public consumption policies? That's a good question, too. Um, this is this is a, t a tricky one. Um, I think the, the main rationale for banning public consumption is that uh, there's a, people don't really want to be normalizing use um, so that it could potentially induce demand. And certainly we've learned from tobacco that there is, op, you know, when public consumption is available, it potentially models that behavior for younger people. Um, but at the same time, though, in, in jurisdictions that have an outright ban on public consumption, there is concerns of that that will lead to increased um, risk for exposure to secondhand smoke from cannabis and also for nuisance um, for neighbors in congregate uh, housing settings, for example, um, who may be exposed to cannabis smoke uh, involuntarily. And so I think um, it's probably most pragmatic to take a a balanced approach and to allow some for some public consumption, um, but perhaps to have strict requirements in terms of not allowing public consumption at festivals or at um, places where children are congregated or near health care facilities. But, you know, I think you could argue it one way or the other, and there isn't, uh, there isn't enough data to say conclusively what the best policy approach is here yet. But obviously the variations we're seeing across the provinces and territories will allow us to study that aspect and to try and um, put some evidence uh, to that question. Someone has asked, Stephanie's asking about any info on limits with alcohol co-use for impairment. So if you look at the slide previous, uh, they have, they do have, or they have put in place a uh, limit in terms of having a combined blood alcohol uh, concentration of 2.5 nanograms per milliliter. Um, and, or sorry, a, um, a 0.05 blood alcohol concentration combined with 2.5 nanograms per milliliter within two hours of driving is considered impaired driving and is illegal. Um, in general, though, we know um, from the data that when you use alcohol and cannabis together, uh, they, the impairing effects of both substances are augmented and it can be augmented in unpredictable ways. And so um, generally the harm reduction message there is to avoid mixing those substances. Uh, Ian's asking why there's mandatory testing related to driving for alcohol only um, or for cannabis. Or, so it is only for alcohol, not for cannabis. And I think the reason for that is likely that the science isn't there in terms of testing for impairment for cannabis. So it would be difficult to justify in court uh, the infringement on rights associated with random testing because under under the Canadian Charter we do have a right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure um, except in the interests of uh, fundamental justice including things like public safety so I think that's why they're only doing mandatory testing for alcohol but that's pretty similar to other countries that have moved in that direction and we have seen um, that those policies can be effective for reducing impaired driving uh, Sherilyn is asking, are there any harm reduction guidelines in place yet for the breastfeeding population? That's a really, really good question. And I would say that um, there isn't, and we don't have enough data with regards to breastfeeding uh, to say conclusively what the impact of cannabis consumption is um, when a mom who is breastfeeding is using cannabis. So uh, no, there are not. Although we do know that um, for women who are pregnant, uh, it's advisable is to avoid using cannabis um, because more frequent and heavy patterns of use are associated with uh, lower birth weight. 
Benjamin's asked, what are the rules, standards that we put in place on retail employees when it comes to providing medical advice around cannabis use to consumers? Excellent question. Each of the provinces will be determining that. And I suspect that the education will vary considerably across jurisdictions. Um, and so in most cases, I think that information is still TBD, but you'll have to watch your, um, your provincial websites to see um, what gets put in place. I know in Alberta, cannabis will be regulated by the Alberta Liquor and Gaming Commission, and they are um, planning to have some education and that will be posted online or some information about that will be posted online. Alexandra's asking if I have any knowledge on how it may affect travel to the USA, for example. I know there have been some border issues with being asked if you've ever used cannabis and being banned turned away at the border. Yeah, so cannabis will still be absolutely illegal to transport to the US. Uh, cannabis remains illegal under American federal law, and so you cannot bring it into the country. And if you're convicted of cannabis charges in Canada, uh, you may still be refused at the border in the United States. And so if you plan to participate in the legal cannabis market, do not transport that product um, when you go on vacation to the U.S. Uh, Leela is saying the table you presented comparing the approaches of different provinces was great. I'm wondering if there's conference of info on the guidelines that each province is developing regarding personal cultivation. Not that I have seen yet. In fact, it was even difficult to ascertain in general <laughs> what what the guy, what the rules were. And so I know that some of the federal bodies, like the CCSA, for example, are working to develop sort of uh, a touch, uh, sort of a comprehensive uh, outline of all the different provincial and territorial policy approaches. And so I'm hopeful that some of that information will be made public shortly. But I think in a lot of cases, the provinces are still developing those personal cultivation guidelines. And some of that personal cultivation will also be influenced by municipal bylaws. Um, and so some cities or municipalities may uh, opt to regulate personal cultivation further than what's set at the provincial level. And the last question comes from Murray. What is your opinion on cannabis use in group home settings for persons with intellectual disabilities? Uh, that's a tough question. I think if we're talking about medical cannabis, um, there isn't necessarily a lot of evidence to support therapeutic use um, for mental health or for cognitive uh, function. Um, and if we're talking about non-medical cannabis, I think it's going to be up to individual programs, um, as well as not only group homes and sort of public housing projects, but also um, private like residential te tenant boards uh, to set their own rules. Um, in some jurisdictions that may not be possible, it really depends on the provincial legislation. And we have seen Saskatchewan, Alberta, and some others considering um, beefing up guidelines to enable uh, those kind of landlord bodies to set their own rules around cannabis consumption. So I think we have to take, I have to end it there because I actually have to go to the airport <laughs> to catch a flight, but I'm really grateful for everyone for joining today. Um, it was a pleasure to talk about some of the uh, cannabis legalization policies as they've been developing. And I'd encourage you to contact me by email if you have any additional questions. Uh, great. Thank you, Dr. Hishka. Um, I very much appreciate your uh, dealing with the technology components and everyone else out there. Um, so if you could uh, have you mute your microphone. Um, so there is a poll here we'd ask you to as you exit. That's a great. Thanks. Um, we are recording this. We will edit out all these little bits, everyone, for, for your listening pleasure in the future. I really appreciate Dr. Hishka taking time out of her schedule. She's actually not at home. She's in Toronto in a hotel room um, doing something else and, and agreed to do this in between all that. So we really do appreciate uh, her taking the time. Um, we will be sending out a link to the recording, and in that same link we will have uh, the PowerPoint in a PDF version. It's a quite large file, folks. We can't email it to you. Uh, if you do have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to follow up either uh, with us, and we can pass it on to Dr. Hishko. Our information will be in the PowerPoint. And we really appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, our next planned webinar is April 18th. We will send a link out to everyone for that. And uh, thank you for attending, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And thank you very much, Dr. Hishko.